good. Welcome everyone who's joining. Right, uh, let's um, let's make a start then. So if you could uh, go on to that. So I'll just um, just run through a few um, kind of housekeeping points so that everyone's aware uh, just before uh, the talk starts. So um, just to let you know that there will be time, uh, hopefully about 15 minutes for the for the question and answers after the presentation. Uh, so think of questions uh, that you've got uh, throughout the talk. Um, I don't know the um, how you can see the, the speaker, uh, but we recommend you that if you can, you position that in the top right corner of your screen so you can see the slides easily. Um, you should know that a video of the webinar will be emailed to you by Friday and will then be available on the OR Society website afterwards. So you can share it with all of your OR friends. Uh, there'll also be a survey coming around, so please do uh, respond to that. Uh, in terms of during the, the webinar, um, you can use the chat function if you have um, kind of questions, uh, for just generic questions about the webinar or the OR Society. Um, but if you've got a question that you want to ask uh, the speaker at the end of the talk, then please use the Q&A function. So don't put questions for Stephen in the uh, chat. Please put them in the Q&A. And when they're in the Q&A, you can vote for them. So you can upvote, upvote them. And I will um, ask the most popular questions uh, at the end. Democracy in action. Okay, so... Um, I'll introduce our speaker for today. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce um, Stephen Mayer. So Stephen is a lecturer at the University of Exeter, uh, but he has an extensive uh, background in OR and uh, optimization solver development, um, which started with his PhD in OR in Australia. Um, from there, he moved to the Zusa Institute in Berlin uh, to do a postdoc where he was developing mixed integer programming solvers. So he has kind of extensive experience with that. Uh, and then in 2017, he was awarded an EPSRC postdoctoral fellowship, um, which he carried out his research first at Lancaster University and then in Exeter. So aside from, from that, uh, he has a long-standing interest in, in beer and beer making, having made his, fir his first home brew over 10 years ago, I understand. Uh, and he's been to lots of breweries. So this talk is really a combination of all of those interests in OR, optimization solvers and beer. And uh, I'm sure a lot of us already know about the optimization of beer consumption but um, I'm sure we're going to learn something about the optimization of beer production today. So I'll uh, hand over to you, Steve. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Edwin. And thanks for the nice introduction. And uh, thank you everyone for coming along to this webinar. And so I, this is, I guess, a, it's a little bit of a story of, of, I guess, my process in trying to see whether optimization could be used within the beer production process. And so I just, I'm going through from more of a, I guess it's, it's the development process of, of going into an industry project uh, from, a, I guess, a more of a fun side of the fun industry and talking about how I developed the model over time to then come to a, what is, a, I guess, a usable product for, for breweries. So where this all really kicked off was that um, I was sitting in a brewery and I just was, uh, look, I looked up at one of the, look, looked up while I was drinking a beer there. And I saw this whiteboard and it looked a bit like this. This is not actually what I saw. This is something that I made up myself to use later. But so I had, it had the days of the week and then it had certain tasks that need to be done on that day or on each day. And you could see there's sort of grouped together in different things. So there's, there's, there's like the brewing of a, of a beer, the packaging of it, uh, preparing it, uh, transportation. Now, all these things, this is what I was making up from, from memory. It's not actually what happens. And I now know if I were to do this again, now it would be a very different board. 
but you see how there's different, there's a bit of a flow. So you, the green will go through, so you'll have this batch number. So on that IPA, you've got B122, and then that is going to be brewed. Um, so it, it gets packaged a little bit later. Um, and then you have different, um, so and then you have the, the, the prep happening before the brewing. And so you have these different, this flow going through the system. And so from this, I, I so when I realized that, I looked at it and thought the first thing was, oh, that's, that's an optimization problem. And so the next step was to write a blog about it. And so I decided to put this on uh, my website, Optimization in the Real World, to just talk about how you could potentially use optimization within a brewery. The main thing about this optimization problem and the, the way I thought about this was that it was like a machine scheduling problem. And so the machine scheduling problem from the point of view that your jobs are the beers that you're going to be making. And then you had a number of machines. So the, the brew kits, uh, the fermentation vessels and whatever equipment that you have in the brewery. And so you needed to assign these jobs to the equipment, but in the, in the right order to be able to satisfy some, uh, some objective. And so the, what that objective is, it's not exactly clear immediately, but there is this some job shop scheduling or machine scheduling idea behind what would be done in a brewery. So that was my first thought. And then from this, because I, I, I was a little bit more curious now, I've written, written this blog, I actually wanted to find out what brewers actually did or what were breweries using in, in the, like what were they using for their scheduling? So I decided to get in contact with some of these breweries. Uh, so being down in Exeter, I guess the, a large concentration of breweries are actually in Bristol. And so I was able to um, head up there and start talking to some breweries and finding out what they're actually doing. So the main thing was, I wanted to know what were their current scheduling practices and also what were they actually using for that scheduling or for the production planning. And importantly, was there actually an opportunity for bringing optimization in and could that help them out? So was there, could optimization really improve the beer making process? And so the main things that I learned here were that, yes, there were, soft, there were software products out there. And so these software products really cover a large range of things. So, they, 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 so there's some that really cover every single process, part of the brewing process. Um, and they can actually be too much for what a small brewery would need because like there's a lot about inventory management which a small brewery may not have that big a requirement for um even distribution and delivery they may not be running their own distribution network so their, their focus is not necessarily about the scheduling um, they, they could have some scheduling components in there but that wasn't actually the key parts of it Another interesting thing that I found was that within the, the like across the brewing breweries that I talked to, there was a very big range of digital proficiency. So there were some companies that were, that were invested in software, some developed their own software and that software was actually quite sophisticated and some didn't even use software at all. So it was just a, they, they were just happy to brew how they like on a day by day basis and decide what they were going to do whenever they like, like on, on the fly. But there was actually some desire even so across the spectrum uh, to have some idea or some more systematic approach for the scheduling. And this is in some ways to get beyond the fact that they were, so they were, a lot of these systems were actually done in Excel. So they wanted to get away from Excel to have something a little bit more automated other than the bit more manual approach that Excel is sort of driven by. So just to talk about the brewing process was that, so if we take the, so when, if you go into any brewery at all, you may have seen this, or if you've been on a brewery tour, you may see an, this, a, a, some sort of process that it looks a little, a little bit like this. Now, there's a number of different steps in making a beer. Uh, they, so here they've actually got seven different steps written down. And so that's going from actually taking the grains themselves, uh, extracting the malt from those grains, uh, making the beer with like through adding the hops, 
you, you have a boil process, then you go into the fermentation step, and then once it's fermented, you could package it. Well, you, you should package it actually, if you want to drink it. Now, th this is the, I guess, the overall process that a brewer has to take to make a beer. It's not the process that you really care about when you're looking at the scheduling of beer making, because there's a lots of steps there that actually all happen at the same time. So when we actually do go into the beer making process or the, the scheduling of the beer making process, we really break it down into three key steps. So the first step is brewing or beer making. And so that really covers a lot of, diff lot of these initial stages of this, of this process. And so what's at, at the end of this step, you end up with something that can be fermented. So once you've added the yeast, it goes into the ferment fermentation stage. One thing to note here is that this really takes around about a day. Uh, so some, some breweries may not have the equipment to do it in a day, that might take them more than one day, but it's, roughly it's about a day. Then we go into the fermentation step. And so then this is a very long process. Uh, this can take, I say, depending on the beer type, we'll say it takes about um, a week, a bit more. Um, if you, so that would be for say like a, an ale. If you were to brew a lager, it would be a longer process. It'd be more like uh, 20 days or something. And then once the fermentation process is finished, it goes into packaging. So really when we're scheduling, we only really care about these three steps. And these are the three, I guess, machines in the machine scheduling process. But really when I'm, when I'm actually looking at the scheduling process, I don't necessarily care about the packaging. I'm only really caring about those first two stages. And so those first two stages require the equipment of the, these two pieces of equipment. So we have a brew kit. And so in smaller breweries, you normally have one of these. You might have two, but it's really, you don't have a lot of these because it, it's not, you can only use one a day. So if you had more than one, you'd need multiple brewers. And so that's why we normally have one. Then the, so you could have, um, and then you have the fermentation vessels. Now there's normally more of these because if the fermenta fermentation takes a lot longer than brewing. So if you want to be able to make multiple beers at a time, then you need to have multiple fermentation vessels. So we really have this one to many approach. And also this is where the scheduling has to come in because you will have, you have one beer that's being made and then it has to go into an empty fermentation vessel which is then taking, which is occupied for a certain period of time. So then uh, there are other optional parts, um, but it, we won't care, we won't really consider them initially, but you could have conditioning vessels, which is a step after the fermentation vessels. You could also consider the canning and bottling lines, which is that packing stage. And you can also consider storage facilities. So when I actually went about this, so I've spoken to the breweries and I have, I've sort of put together an idea of what an optimization problem should look like for a brewery. And so I had this idea that looked a little bit like this. So this is a little bit, so it's a bit of a Gantt chart, but it's, so don't consider this as being the, being to scale, because as I said, brewing takes about a day, fermentation takes say 10 days or maybe 20 days if it's depending on the beer type. So these aren't really to scale. It's just to, to, uh, to show you how the process should come together. So I had these four stages that I wanted to look at. So we've got brewing, then it goes into fermentation, and then it goes, once the fermentation is done, then the packaging, and then into storage. From this initial design, I really went through the literature trying to work out what really fits this, um, fits this design here. And the thing that I came up with was an integrated problem between machine scheduling and lot sizing. So the machine scheduling part was the, the um, assigning of the beers to the brewing and the fermentation um, equipment. And then the lot sizing is the management of the production and the storage. And so really we want to have, so the, the problem definition there is to really take a set of jobs and we schedule them on machines and we want to ensure that the demand and storage constraints are, are, are satisfied. And so these demand constraints are really, the num when does the beer actually need to be delivered by? And the, st the inventory is, is how much cold storage do you have for these, uh, for these beers? 
And so the, the jobs are the beers that you're going to brew. And then, as I said, the, the machines are the brew kit and the fermentation vessels. Okay, so when I actually came up with this optimization problem, I'm not going to go through the details of this because it's not actually what I ended up using. I came up with a, a solution that looked a little bit like this. Now, I'm sorry, it's a bit small here. It's the, I guess it's the output of a model which I developed um, a while ago, so I haven't really got in the, in the shape for a presentation here, but it does work given that we've got this online environment. You can get up close to your screen. So on the top, you see your scheduling. So this is a, this is a Gantt chart that, that, has, that has got the brews that are being, or the, the schedule of the beer making. So the top line there is actually the use of the brew kit. And then the next five lines are the use of the fermentation vessels. And so on the right, you'll see the different beer types that we're making. So we've got a West Coast IPA, a Stout, a Session IPA, Black IPA, American Pale Ale, and then this one called Noble. Now we have these different beers that are being brewed. Uh, and so they're taking, taking, in this case, they're taking two days each. So we can only brew two beers a week. And so you can see why there's, there's, there's these clusters of beers that are being brewed together because over the weekend, you're not doing any brewing. But then as it goes further away from that, from the start of the, that time horizon, you've got a bit more spread out. And that's just because of the objective function we're using in that case. Now I wanted to put your attention to the red bars. And so with the red bars, we actually have the second line here, which is the inventory and the orders. So the orders are the, I guess the bars on that second graph and the inventory are the lines. And so in this prototype, which I developed, I looked at inventory as being one, like it, it, once you finish a beer, it's just that you have one of it. Like it's just the, the, the block completion of a beer, not breaking it down into its kegs and bottles or cans. So this is just from the prototyping point of view. And then when you have a, when the order is satisfied, then the inventory will drop down. And so you can see how the line jumps up once one of the beers has been completed brewing out of fermentation vessel one. And then we have an order that's come in, but then that doesn't jump up again because a beer had just uh, completed at the end of fermentation vessel five. And then the inventory will drop down when that order is taken uh, just after September 1st then. And so we see that again happening, uh, the, the, the inventory jumps up again just after se September 15. Now, this is the integrated lot sizing and machine scheduling problem. Now, I took this to, uh, to the breweries and I, just to see what they were, whether it was actually worthwhile. So this is a prototype I wanted to see whether it would suit their needs. So the feedback was inventory was not really much of a concern. So normally the beers are made and then they get, they get distributed fairly quickly. Uh, storage isn't that much of an issue. Cold storage, they generally have enough capabilities to store the beer that they're producing. And also demand wasn't really that much of a concern for them either. They didn't really, they, they were brewing as they required it. And it's also quite difficult to forecast. Uh, so there are some forecasting systems out there, but it does, it does become difficult. And generally you're brewing similar beers a lot. And so you just keep the regulars going and then you have specialty beers on the side. So they weren't interested too much in this inventory order aspect of it. And also it didn't really work from the visualization point of view. However, what they did like was that Gantt chart thing. And so that was quite useful for them and it did match some of the tools that they were using in the past. So that was something to really push ahead with. And I needed to look more on this machine scheduling point of view as opposed to this lot sizing idea. And so that took me to the first iteration. And so I updated the design to, so I dropped the packaging part. And so really there's only three steps and this is the three steps that I showed you in that uh, complete brewing process that I talked about initially. And so we've got the brewing, the fermentation and then packaging. So I'm gonna go into more detail about this model because this is the model that I'm actually using. And so I'll actually go into the, the design of the mathematical model to give a little bit of a background uh, and for those people who are actually interested in the mathematics of it. So really this becomes a multi-stage parallel machine scheduling problem. And so the reason it is multi-stage is because you have those two steps. You've got the brewing step and then the fermentation step. And so these are two separate machines, but they're two machines that have to be used in sequence. And so we're gonna have 
a set of jobs, which are the beers to brew, and actually go down even to more details, actually they get a unique ID per the, the, the brew that, that, that's being made. So, the, so every, every time a beer goes into the, into the brew kit, that actually gets a new ID. And so that is, we don't care necessarily about the beer type, that is important from, from other bits of data, but in terms of the flow of the job, we care about that unique ID. And so in these two different stages, we have the brew kit, which is one stage, and then the fermentation, fermentation vessels, which is the second stage. And as I mentioned earlier, we normally have one brew kit and there's going to be multiple fermentation vessels. Now I've actually defined an objective here now. So I'm actually trying to minimize the make span. And so the make span is, trying, is minimizing how long it takes to finish the last job of your set of jobs. And so we're trying to squeeze all the jobs down as, as much as possible. So you could actually have some slack in the middle because if you have longer running jobs, they could actually push to the end of the, end of the horizon that you're looking at. Okay, so in terms of this problem, I took a time discretization approach. So because the brewing actually has, a, as a, I guess, a time schedule of, of in the order of days, I could actually break this down into a, like a time discretization of days. I had some variables which define when an item, an item or an order goes into a particular piece of equipment. So these XIKT variables are saying whether order I goes into brew kit K in time T, and then the Y variables are for fermentation vessels. So order I going into fermentation, fermentation vessel V at time T. And so these are the key parts of the, of the model. And so one thing you might notice here is that I'm actually looking at just when it starts in the vessel. So I don't actually care about when it's in the vessel, I, that is all constrained. Well, that is, that is con, I guess, dealt with in the constraints. So the constraints that are important here are, so, so, at the, so actually this is the modeling step. So we actually take the, the, the brewery and we the discretize it essentially. So now in terms of the constraints, so the first one is conflict constraints. So this is pretty obvious. You can't brew two beers in the one, you can't use two pieces of equipment, the same equipment for two different orders at the same time. So really that's just trying to move it across into a different time period. And these are just very classic constraints for such problems. The next one is a sequencing constraint. And this is actually sequencing is important from the point of view that we have these two different stages and successive stages. And so we really say that if a brew is going to be made in brew kit at time one, then it has to be put into a fermentation, fermentation vessel at time two. And then again, if, it's, if there's something being in the brew kit at time two, then it has to go into a fermentation vessel at time three. And so we have this time period as well, this horizon when the time fermentation vessel is actually being occupied. And as I mentioned earlier, this isn't done by the variables, it's actually controlled by the constraints. So you can't actually use the fermentation vessel for a certain amount of time based on the fermentation time of that beer type. Another thing that's important, which isn't quite obvious here, is that the fermentation vessel actually has to be empty while you're using the brew kit for that beer. So in time period one there, we actually have, so we can't have a beer that's currently in the fermentation vessel in, in so we have to have at least one empty fermentation vessel when we're actually brewing a beer. And so that's not actually, I haven't really mentioned that in, in the other stages, but it's something that has to be controlled through the model that you're using. So one thing that came up as I was writing, doing some prototypes for this is that you actually needed to make sure that you penalize unscheduled jobs. And so this is to make sure, because if you, so the, the shortest make span that you can have is actually not to schedule any jobs at all. And so that's an, an important step that you really need to consider. And then the make span objective is also an important thing. We could use different objectives. Uh, there's lots of uh, literature on the objectives that you could use for machine scheduling. I chose make span because it's an easy one to explain and it fits the purpose relatively well. Okay, so I built this system and I put this into, I guess I gave, I took it to the breweries again and started talking about 
how useful that could be for them. And so this machine scheduling approach was actually, it, it worked quite well. And so they, they liked the idea of it. So it, they, have, they weren't up to the stage of using at this point, but it really gave me something to go on to discuss what needs to happen or what do they need to be able to use, use this scheduling process. And so it wasn't until the point that I gave them something that they could actually look at and really understand that they could tell me of the other details that actually needed to be considered. And so there are actually, so these, these things are actually just very subtle details that you don't necessarily think about until you really get into the modeling aspect of it. So one, so the important parts here are actually brewing happens on specific days. And so this is really related to the fact that you have a brewer who's going to be doing the brewing and they may actually not work five days a week. You can't, they, they may not, you may want, um, you can't brew on weekends because, uh, for, for obvious reasons. And so you need to know when the brewer is actually going to be working. And so this is, so that really dictates how you can schedule your jobs. The fermentation has to complete on a weekday or a working day because stuff needs to happen. And so you need staff to be able to do that when the fermentation ends. The good new news with that though, is that you can actually leave a beer in the fermentation vessel for a number of days beyond the, the fermentation time. So the actual fermentation time is actually just a minute minimum. You can actually extend that to be able to get you to a appropriate day. So, so really this just restricts, so it doesn't really restrict when you can do the fermentation. It just means it restricts when the fermentation vessel is going to be occupied. Again, it's not too much a restriction because this is, would be more like if the fermentation vessel, if ferment, fermenting ends on a, on a Saturday, it just means it's going to be pushed to the Monday that it'll be ending. Now this isn't totally true because you do have the case where um, you have a specific staff member to do the packaging. And so if you have, a, and so in that case, that staff member may only be working on certain days. So you need to be able to, you need that your fermentation to end on the days that the, that that staff member will be there to do the packaging. Now, again, it doesn't really restrict when you start the brew, but it does actually restrict it does mean that you could be using that fermentation vessel for a much longer period of time than you, what you could potentially use in the most efficient solution. Then there's also the extra step of conditioning. So some of the breweries that I was talking to didn't have conditioning vessels, so it wasn't a concern for them, but then some breweries did. And so after fermenting, the beer could then actually go into the conditioning vessel. And again, that has a minimum amount of time that you want to go into the conditioning vessel. And then you have the same concerns with that, with the conditioning as you do with fermenting, where that you have a minimum amount of time and then also it has to end on a working day or it has to end, and it definitely has to end on the packaging day. So these are all subtle details that only really come about after that discussion and uh, this iterative process of developing an optimization model for, for breweries to use in their scheduling process. So, some other practical considerations that we need to look at. And so this is from beyond just the optimization point of view. So this optimization is actually only a really, really small part of the complete scheduling tool. Uh, so the optimization is, is an important part of it, but it isn't actually what the user was going to use most of the time. They actually were going to be more interacting with the visualization and the way of entering and, and modifying the schedule as opposed to optimizing the schedule itself. So you needed to really provide this flexibility into a system to allow the user to be actually able to adapt to that. So these such things as fixing tasks in the schedule and then being able to re-optimize over that, um, changing the length of time because you, the working days may change, but they actually may not change for the full time horizon, but only for particular beers, or you may want to ferment for a little bit longer. Um, that's so different things. So you might want to just subtly change things, but these need to be considered or the ability to be able to do this and then actually reflect it in your schedule is a, is a feature that had to be brought into the scheduling tool. 
We also had to work out whether there was, we well, introduced this ability for, I guess, prioritizing how the job should be run. And so this is done through the putting in start dates and end dates for the particular job. So when you want it to be completed by or when you would need it to be started by. Also, this is supposed to be for generally for breweries. So the diff breweries have different um, equipment, pieces of equipment. Uh, they have, they're all different sizes. So we needed to really make it so it was flexible for different breweries. And also if breweries decide to, to grow. So whether they want to add fermentation vessels or add conditioning vessels. Now the ordering the task was actually an interesting one that, uh, that came up. So it's not, from the optimization point of view, every task is identical. So we like as as the mathematician, we don't really care what um what what order the, the the beers are being made in, but from the business point of view, you do actually care when they're coming out and what and like you don't want to brew two IPAs at the same like immediately after each other if you actually need a pay layer. So these are the things that really needed to be considered, uh, and also the the user has to be able to understand or interact with this optimization system. And so that's, so this is where all these practical things come in that it go beyond what the optimization, be just the, the simple optimization problem. So the way this was actually implemented, and this is just an overview of the, of the software that was used. So the, it was actually developed as a, as a website. And so I used uh, Python and Flask to make this a dynamic website. And the choice of Python was to make the use of the optimization solvers a little bit easier. So the optimization solver that I used was Skip. And I have, um, and the reason for Python was because I used the PySkip opt interface. Now there's a dashboard uh, that's associated with this, which is um, used for, uh, so I use Plotly to be able to do that. And this type of tool is more of an optimization as a service tool. The, the ability to deploy this was actually uh, done using the Google Firebase. And so this is a storage of the, I use this for a database storage and also to be able to, I guess, host this website and optimization engine that I'm using for the scheduling process. So something to consider here is that the optimization here is actually not very big. So the scheduling problem can be looked up, it can be handled by human by hand fairly easily. It might take a bit of time, but it can be done. It's not, it's not really prohibitive for a human. For the automated optimization though is it takes less than five seconds. So there is a significant speed up compared to humans. Now, the way the big gain comes from is actually the re-optimization. So if you, something does change and you say your fermentation takes a little bit longer than you expected, and then you need to shuffle around your brew, your brew schedule, then that means you have to do everything from scratch again. Now, if this is, um, so given that, uh, so if this takes say an hour for a human, five seconds is quite a nice speed up from that re-optimization point. Also, you don't, so things, you don't really have too much flexibility in a hand done schedule. So it's, that's, and that's also part of the practical considerations where you need to be able to introduce that flexibility. Now then the main goal here was actually to provide some, provide oversight to the brewery and to allow them to be, to adapt as things change over time. So just as a small example as to what we actually used and, and what we developed, this is the, so this is what the end result would look like after an optimization. Now, so I've taken this, this was done uh, this morning and so I've just taken a snapshot. So the optimization started today in a actual brewery, you would have beers that are currently being used all the time, uh, beers that are being brewed all the time. So you probably wouldn't have an empty fermentation vessel up, or in this case you would need it because you need to actually have some empty space to put the beer in. Now, what we, have, what we see here at the top, this is the dashboard for looking at the solution for the optimization. And so we have that Gantt chart again, very similar to that initial one. In this case, we've gotten rid of completely of the inventory part because for, we, we discovered that wasn't, that wasn't necessary. And then we have all the beers that are being produced over that period of time. So I've actually included a long running beer. So we have here the, the Pilsner, which is the, the green bars there. 
And so this actually takes about 20 days. And so you can see the beers that are being produced on the bottom right there. And so and they've got a brew time of one day and a fermentation time of between 10 to 20 days. And so I put in a couple of different numbers there, just a little bit of a test. These, these aren't necessarily realistic numbers, they're just test numbers. And so one thing that I mentioned though with the make span, you can see there where the, how that um, can affect the optimization solution. Now that Pilsner is being brewed a lot later than you might expect given that there is fermentation vessels available. And the reason for that is that it's actually trying to minimize the end time of the lo longest running job. The longest running job there is actually that pale ale, which is the brown lines there. And so the Pilsner actually runs until the end of that pale ale and also until the end of the, um, and so also to the end of the, um, oh, so the IPA is actually the, um, the brown one there. So the pale ale and the IPA. Now, if we had a different objective as to minimize uh, we actually try to have the earliest scheduling of all jobs, then we'd actually see a shift of everything going to the left. So it's really dependent on the objective function that you're going to use. So th this is the, so this is where we see that it's um, actually possible to, I guess, use optimization, but really we need a, a full scheduling tool around it to be able to introduce this optimization into the scheduling process for a beer production plan. So just to finish up on this, the story that I've told here is that um, in terms of an industry project, feedback and iteration is very important. It's a very important step in order to get to a tool that is going to be useful for the, for the companies that you're working with. And so, like as I showed, the first step actually had a very, com very different optimization problem to actually what, we're going, what we end up using in the end. And it wasn't until we actually had that, 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 that first prototype that we're actually able to discuss with the companies and determine that it wasn't actually going to be useful for them. Because I, up, up until that point, they, did, they didn't really know how optimization was going to be used. So in the end, we developed this multi-stage parallel machine scheduling problem. And this seems to work quite well. And it actually is very flexible in allowing us to extend to that extra conditioning vessel uh, to adding conditioning vessels because it is just another stage within this, within this process. And it really works well in this uh, time discretization. Time discretization doesn't work in cases where you have large, um, like a large time horizon, but given our time steps are just days, it is very effective in this case. And we do have a very fast optimization solution here. Now, given the problem sizes aren't too large, the biggest gains here are actually the reoptimization. And so this is something that I think can be very useful in, uh, for craft breweries and, and small breweries to be able to try and build, a, uh, to be able to, I guess, adapt as things change over time. And so this, does, so this is a tool that we have made available for craft breweries and it is, it, it's trying to, I guess, help support the op manage and manage their operations. So thank you very much for your time. And um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed the talk. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Maybe everyone, people could take their uh, mute button off and give a little round of applause. I don't know if that would work. <laughs> no? Thank you. Okay. Um, great. So we've got a nice lot of time for uh, questions after that. So um, a lot of you have already submitted questions, which is great. I think if you click on the Q&A, you can actually go and um, upvote the questions that you most want answered. Uh, and of course, you can, um, you can answer, uh, you can ask more as well. Oh, I see, right, you can't, you don't have a mute button, but that's fine. We, we know you're clapping at home, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we can kick off with the first one, uh, but please do keep um, asking them and upvoting during the process. Uh, which is, um, can you talk a bit more about how you built the penalty parameters? Um, and that was on slide 13, I think you were talking about um, penalizing jobs that were unscheduled. Yes, yeah, so it was really just a, uh, so it, it was just a big M constraint on, on that case. So if we did have an unscheduled job, then it was going to, so then it, it just um, made a, the, the binary variable got uh, switched on with, the big, with this big M and then that was the penalty that was added to the objective. So it wasn't really, uh, yeah, so I, I didn't, um, 
it, it was really just to design, the, the design was to make sure that we had every job being scheduled within that um, optimization. And so that penalty doesn't really come in. It's, it's, it's just because our time horizons are big enough to make sure every job can actually be scheduled. So they won't ever, so we'll never actually get hit by using that, um, by using that uh, penalty. So, mm -hmm. so you just shed, come into the objective. Schedule everything. Yep. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so the next one is, have you looked at similar batch producing industries, uh, for example, antibiotic uh, production and dye stuffs? So uh, no, I haven't actually looked um, too far beyond um, just the, the brewing industry. So this is, this is just something that started off as a side project. And so it wasn't really a, a research project initially. And so uh, now I've gone into this a bit more. I think it's, it's becoming more of a research project that I want to look into. So it's actually nice to hear about other areas that I could look into because it's something I wasn't initially um, scheduling isn't my area of expertise. So this is something I'm sort of developing as I go along. And so it's good to, yeah. So knowing about these um, other batch scheduling systems um, or industries actually could be helpful um, actually developing this a little bit further. So it's um, interesting from, from one point of view that since this is in the food and drink industry, it could be looked at as a more of a process industry um, or process scheduling um, problem. And I guess that's, it doesn't come into that. That isn't much of a concern because it's, because of this batch idea, as you mentioned. So yeah, I, I think I need to look into that a bit more into other batch um, mm. production areas. So some people want to know, um, is this work available um, in a paper or have you got the model written down somewhere? So no, the work's not available as yet. So this is just, so I haven't, I haven't written the paper because I was still going through a couple of small details about what are the key components of of an optimization solution for breweries. And so that was those practical considerations uh, that I had. Um, and so that was things that I wanted to make sure were included in any model that I, I developed. The, the main focus has actually been on developing the software at, at this point. So I wanted to get that available for the breweries. Uh, so that's, that's getting, um, so that, that will be available for them um, shortly. And so the one, the ones that I've been, the ones that I've been working with. And so I, w I should, hopefully we'll have that paper prepared in the next uh, couple of months. Great. Um, did you consider the modifications made by the plant operator in subsequent optimizations? Uh, yes. Yes. So, um, so I'm guessing you're talking about if there's changes to the, I guess the times of how long things would take. So fermentation or, um, or, yeah, or if they want to fix tasks, that was uh, that was a key thing that I need to bring in. So that's so if the the length of time was changed, then that needed to be reflected within the optimization if they want to re-optimize later. Now the so there was something that I had to develop further. So this is from the software point of view, was actually trying to work out what was the best way to link the fermentation times to the jobs. And so that was, it was actually became critical to make sure that the fermentation times were linked to the orders themselves as opposed to the beer types, because the beer types could, so that, that's where the brewer could actually change the length of time that they wanted. So based on the order itself, as opposed, because if you look at the beer types, then that's just going to be giving your minimum fermentation time. And then it can be adapted later on by the, by the brewer, um, when it's actually in practice. Great. So a few people want to know um, about uh, whether it's um, in use, and uh, if so, do you ha or do you have? Uh, can you benchmark it to real uh, examples? And um, have you got feedback from it and all of that sort of thing? So at this stage, it's not, uh, so it's, it's not being in, it's not in active use at this stage. So it's still, it's still in development. Um, and so that's, it will be hopefully in active use in the next, like, I guess, couple of months. And do you have any idea how much improvement it will make or whether it will make an improvement until you do that or? So I, I don't know whether actually, so in terms of efficiency, it's, it's not really 
designed to make their brewery more efficient because these are very small breweries uh, that I'm talk talking to. So I think if it became, if, if it was used by a larger brewery, then you might be able to extract some more efficiencies by using some optimization. But these are, so since they're very small breweries, they like they have uh, maybe five to 10 fermentation vessels. Uh, it's actually quite easy to comprehend the optimization problem for them. So they have a good understanding of how they should actually use their equipment. So it's a, really the main thing is actually the adaptation to changes. And that's where this is, is helpful in trying to improve the time that's needed to do the optimization. So I, I, so I don't really think we'll see really, for the small breweries, I don't think we'll see efficiency gains um, in terms of their equipment usage. Uh, but I do think we'll see, I guess, time gains from, from, their, own act, from, from their own work. We, I think they will be able to, um, I guess, do more, spend more time doing other things as opposed to sitting in front of a computer working on an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> um, that kind of leads naturally onto this question about the objective um, and, and whether um, with uh, your, your minimization of the make span, will that give you the same total time as if you try to put early scheduling in the solution? Um, yeah, so that's a, that one's, I, I'm, it's a good question. So I don't, I don't expect, I guess, I guess it depends on the instance, whether the make span will give you the same total time. Mm. Uh, so I'm not, yeah, I, I can't, I'd have to look at the instance to actually work that one out. So I, I'm not, I couldn't give you an answer on that one. There's probably a more theoretical, uh, more theoretical work that you could look at that to determine whether that's actually the case or not. Hmm. There's a really interesting question here about demand. So you, you mentioned that demand, um, you know, is it's, there's some uncertainty perhaps in the demand and obviously it, it affects the number of jobs you've got to schedule. So can you kind of talk a bit more about that maybe? Yeah, so there are, so demand forecasting of the, so from the breweries that I spoke to, it wasn't that widely used. So there was one brewery that uh, did quite, a, did a very good job in their, their scheduling and demand forecasting. And so there they, there they were really making the beers to match that demand profile. And so they had a, um, every, every week they would actually sit down and work out how they would like work out what would be the next beers that they need to make for this week based on what they forecast the, the um, I guess their sales. So in terms of like for other groups, demand wasn't really coming in so much because they, so one of the, my major partners, they didn't, they didn't need to worry about it too much because they had a contract to sell one of their beer types or two of their beer types all the time. So they were always able to, they just know, knew that they needed to brew this one, uh, these two beer types like once a week or um, every, like whenever they, whenever they can to be able to satisfy that requirement. And then they just use the other, other equipment for special, special brews. So, so in terms of, how it affected their process. It, it didn't like for it really, it was a big, big mix between the breweries because some really cared and some didn't really see it as, as something that they needed to consider. So it's, it's really like I, I myself haven't really looked at the demand and that's something that you can. So I think from a, so from a good forecasting model, you can actually make a good, you can work out what your demand profile is quite well. And there are effective tools out there. And so there's lots of research being done on forecasting. Um, I'm not sure in this particular space, but I do, if someone is interested in this, I would recommend going through, uh, I guess, forecasting literature to determine if that's something that would be useful for, for you. Um, but um, yeah, there, there are, it can be quite valuable to use forecasting in, the, in brewing, uh, but it, it wasn't always needed for the breweries that I talked to. Mm. Great. Um, there's two questions about re-optimization here. So um, how often is, is re-optimization kind of typically, would it typically be needed during the, uh, the brewing process? Uh, and so, and therefore, do you know sort of how much time would be saved uh, from re-optimization? 
Yeah, so I would almost say, so it's at least once a week that you'd need to do this uh, because that's, that's when they'd be, they'd be looking at their schedule at, at that, uh, probably that frequency. So it could be more frequent depending on whether you have uh, changes in your, I guess, the ingredients or um, changes in your, uh, I guess, contracts that you've, you're trying to satisfy. So we're probably looking at maybe a couple, like at least one hour a week, possibly two hours a week that you'd be saving with this. Great. Um, so uh, what about um, uncertainty in the model as well? And that's a big thing kind of in, in OR models generally a big challenge. So um, is there uncertainty over the fermentation time? Uh, somebody wants to know. Uh, yes, actually, not really. So the fer fermentation can be controlled quite well because uh, these fermentation vessels are, are cooled, so they can maintain a constant temperature within them. And so that, that means they, they generally know how long it's going to take. So there are... So one of the breweries I was talking to did have a, some uncertainty around their um, fermentation, uh, just for other other reasons. And then, but um, in in re like really, it's it's quite uh, it's quite well known how long things will take. So mm. the, the uncertainty Maybe if it's might a new, be yeah. new beer or something. Yeah, so it could be a new beer. Uh, it, it could be in. So you might be a difference. So there could be a difference in a day, but I think most of the time it's it's fairly well known. So I, I, that would be an interesting question to look into a bit more to see whether you could extract more efficiency from trying to push towards the most efficient fermentation time. Because if it is on the order of a day that, uh, that you could have some variability, then that is actually quite a lot for, for the brewery because it could actually mean the brew, like you may not be able to brew this week and not have to wait two more days for the next one to go in. And mm. so then, so there could be a good question to actually ask whether you could potentially shorten that minimum fermentation time to allow for, to, to be able to extract more out of your equipment. So there's another good question about the objective here. Um, and and, and uh, they're wondering, uh, would maximizing the production value over the planning horizon uh, be of value rather than minimizing the make span? I suppose this comes down to what you've been talking about with the breweries, what they want to do. Yeah, so that I actually don't have the I don't have figures on on the production value, so I don't know how much like what they actually get out of their beers. So to me, every beer is the same, <laughs> and so that's uh, there. There would be I, like that. That is actually a, a very good point to look into, uh, like how much they're going to be making out of this, and I think that's something I. Um, I, again, I should go back to them about that because it's, it's, it could be a, an important thing to really make, I guess, make this more effective for them to be able to try and extract more out of their, their I guess, their work. But I mean, could you, you just maximize the number of beers or something? You could maximize the number of beers, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but they're all being brewed anyway, so it's probably not you, your maximization is, is it's going to be an identical mm -hmm. solution. This is, we'll probably just have a, probably two, three more questions maybe and then, and then call today. Uh, but somebody wants to know, given the fast reoptimization times, have you considered sensitivity analysis of the input parameters? So for example, changing the number of vessels um, or yeah, something, so I, something like that. I think, so that's something where I see this actually having some value. And so the... So from the scheduling point of view, like as, as I said, it's, it's, it's capable for a human to do this. So, but what, what um, I guess investment decisions are things that you might want to take a little bit more um, care over. And this is where you could actually evaluate whether adding a new fermentation vessel is really going to help you help increase your uh, production um, by, by a lot. So, or you could actually, um, to assess whether you actually need that the extra fermentation vessel that you currently have or whether it could be used for other, other services like or because you, you can actually um, outsource the use of these this equipment to other companies so like blend, uh, software, soft drink blending uh, is, is another thing that can be used that can be done in a fermentation vessel 
So I, I see some value in having this to, I guess this sensitivity analysis as, as they've mentioned, to determine whether you invest in new equipment and actually go through that process a bit more without actually just expecting it's going to improve your production. So I, I see that as, as a good use of this, this tool. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, maybe we'll make this the last question, but um, two people are wondering about byproducts. So yeast, um, or carbon dioxide or other things uh, that they might use in the production. Uh, are there opportunities uh, there to optimize those, uh, the process involving those? Um, for example, do they have to recover or? Yeah, that's, um, that, that is actually a good point. So one of the breweries I worked with, they, they actually have um, some agreements with um, like the, the local community to, I guess, take away some of these byproducts. Uh, so uh, like the, not the carbon dioxide part, but uh, some of the other, so from the, I think from the mash, they uh, give out, have some person come in and take that away to put, take it to a farm. And so there is some, so I guess some cooperative aspects there that could be brought into the model. And so there, there cause there are, there are costs associated with this, but there are also benefits from having these, these other products being used from other, used for other um, purposes. So this is something that I haven't considered in the model, but it is something that would actually be quite interesting to consider in that model. Great. Okay. Um, so uh, it's two o'clock now. Um, so uh, there are a few good questions left, uh, but we may not have time to go through all of them. Um, I don't know. You might be, if it's a quick answer, you might be able to type an answer uh, to them. Um, but I think we should stop it there else we could be going on forever. <laughs> so thank yes. you very, very much, um, Stephen, for the the presentation it was really interesting i think looking at the uh, the comments people really appreciated it okay. and yeah, thank, uh, you. thank, thank you, you to everybody me. who's asked a question as well and uh, watched uh, we really uh, value your participation yeah yeah thank you very much yeah thanks everyone okay